making a DCP in 2019. A lot has changed. Let's talk about it with me, James Gardner, the Sunny Tech Geek. Hi, it's been a long time since I've done a video about DCPs. Now, this year, 2019, is really the the um, year of the SMPTE DCP. It's a big year. If you need to make a DCP, you need to watch this, you need to listen. A lot is changing this year and you need to be aware of it. Um, this year, if you haven't already heard, the US is transitioning to SMPTE DCPs for ORS distribution uh, and the date has been set for April this year. So by the time you probably see this, it's, it's very close to April already. Um, your default setting for making DCPs should be SMPTE. Okay, if you're an independent cinema or independent producer, um, this talk about interrupt SMPTE, well, now we should all only be talking about SMPTE DCPs and all the aspects of that. Now, there's a few gotchas about that. I'll go through um, different bits of software behind me and, and, the, and the pluses and minuses, why would you use one over the other just after this. But firstly, the, one of the main differences of SMPTE DCP and where I think there's a little bit of a misunderstanding is that SMPTE DCP does allow you to use different frame rates. But just because we are now SMPTE DCP doesn't necessarily mean we can um, go away from 24 frames a second because uh, I've actually asked th this at the last ISDCF. This, there is not a lot of understanding about if moving to SMPTE, that it also means, because um, all the equipment has been tested for SMPTE out in the world, very slowly at the moment. Sid, um, many parts of Europe are already classified. America is all but classified with a few locations typically film societies who are lagging behind because they're not doing their upgrades, etc. because there's, you know, there's costs involved. But we are pretty much there and we're going ahead with transitioning to SMPTE. Now, uh, SMPTE allows you to use multiple frame rates, but that doesn't necessarily mean all sites in the world can ut utilise those frame rates. I'd like to get some more data on that, but for example, um, the Series 1 projectors, if you've got a Series 1 which is using the SDI type of inputs, um, Theoretically, they should be able to do 25 and 30 frames a second as well, but it hasn't been tested or widely tested through the industry if that is the case. It might, it might not, don't know. If we find more, we'll probably publish it. Uh, I'd like to publish that out there so people would know to make it be aware of that. But yes, with SMPTE, SMPTE also allows a lot of other aspects and things you need to be aware of. One of the details of SMPTE is a lot of more metadata that needs to go into the DCP. So when you are creating the DCPs, um, there's all these clear text areas. Instead of that, you know, the, the cinema naming convention, that very esoteric TLA or three-letter acronym, it's got acronyms all the way through it. It goes for so many characters, which means something on every acronym. There are also lots of fields in the new one which have clear text versions of the same data. So with the right software, you can actually see what those acronyms really mean and not have to, you know, memorize the naming convention, for example. So those are some very good advantages. Also some other aspects such as the time code of the credits, etc., will now be embedded in the DCP so you don't have to dig that up, find it and type it into your system. Theoretically, it should be able to pick it up from the DCPs which have that in it. You it's, it's an option, you don't have to have it in the DCP, the simple DCP, but you can. And I'm sure that there'll be a transition to that because um, human error and typing and time codes for end credits, etc., do sneak in. And if it's all checked and verified at the, distribu at the distribution center, like a deluxe or similar in your part of the world, it's most likely going to lead to uh, less human errors. But let's talk, you need to make a DCP. So let's talk about who you are and what you want to do. Now, behind me, there are different methods of making DCPs. This is a very well-known um, DCP-O-Matic here, which I've tested quite a lot and it works very well. We've got Resolve, which now has DCP creation built into it. We've got Premiere, which has had DCP built into it for quite a long time, but it's very old and probably the least, you know, the, the one that people would um, suggest you use least. Don't use it. Go to something else like DCP-O-Matic because it is known to be very flaky in terms of cap compatibility out in the field and it hasn't been up updated for a long time. Then there's an industry one here that I, I typically use for my mastering, which is Cine Asset, which is the Dolby mastering tool chain. Now, why would you use, the, these all exist for a particular reason, a particular purpose. Which one's suitable for you? Which one do you need to use and why? So let's go through that very quickly. And I'll go through sort of the, what you may be doing and which product you probably most want to use. Um, and the sort of things you probably need to know to utilize that product effectively. If you're just making um, DCPs for ads or pre-shows and um, just need to knock things out, obviously DCP-O-Matic, it's free, it's on the internet, that's what everyone's using. 
Um, even now for film festivals, if you're an independent film festival and you're using, using Premiere or, or something else, um, you can um, convert your, your master, be it a, you know, uh, convert it to frames or an MOV file and go through this and get a very good result. Now, I used to hear a lot of people say, oh, it's open source, it's no good, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry, but that's not the case. The files out of this are, are certified by CineAsset, for example. There's no problems with the inspection of that, the data that it produces. Um, also, I'm a big believer in open source software because unlike proprietary software where they upgrade it when it's sort of economical to do so, open source just keeps churning along and getting better and better. And DCP has been around quite a long time now, so DCP Omatic is getting pretty damn good. I'm very, I'm very impressed with the feature set and the capabilities that it does have. So there's no real reason that you can, you couldn't use this for doing any sort of pre-show advertising. Uh, even s small independent film distribution through this software. But you do need to know how to use it and understand it. But an editor, it's not that difficult and there's probably some um, videos and other documents on the internet to get you there. And then there's something like um, Resolve. Now, Resolve uh, did something very interesting of late, actually due to some suggestions I made to Peter Chamberlain, who is the, is the chief um, in charge of the Res Resolve development for Blackmagic. And they added um, DCP and IMF export directly from, from Resolve. Now this is a very important issue in, in terms of what I understand, you know, in my opinion, because I see a lot of times as I have run um, uh, mastering facilities for people in the, in the past, and done a lot of mastering for people for theatrical releases, and a lot of the times I see people coming in, uh, or I've seen lots of DCPs which someone spent, you know, you know, their life savings making their first film and they've got every dollar behind it and they've got some guy to, to edit it, etc. You know, we might be talking hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars for this film. And then they get to the end and it's all, they've got the colour graded, he's made sure every pixel's the right colour and then they hand it off to the cheapest DCP creation facility they can find. Usually some guy in, the, in his back room or in his bedroom who's saying I can do DCPs as a common scenario or other, other aspects. And unfortunately, a lot of the times I see these people don't really understand color space. They don't understand the, 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 the path that the data go, goes through. You may have gone through the effort and spent all the money to doing a P3 10-bit be or better color grade, but they use some software to do the DCP, which strips it back to 8-bit, things you don't know, you don't understand. Exporting that, not, that, that service to the cheapest company you can find is just crazy. And realistically, if the colour of that pixel on the screen is that important, you spend a lot of money with your colour grader, it should be his responsibility to bake that colour pic that pixel into the thing that's going up on the screen. And that's why Resolve has adopted the ability within Resolve to export it directly into a DCP. And the reason you want to do that is because then the responsibility of that colour of that pixel on the screen stays with the one person and that's the most the person who needs to do it and that's the colour grader, the person you worked with to make sure those colours were your intent on the screen. And so you export it through Resolve and they use um, the Kakadu um, encoder. Now uh, let's talk about encoders for a sec. Um, there are different, you know, as you know, in the past there's been different MPEG encoders, etc., and the quality has been very different. Kakadu is the oldest and best and the most well-known J2K encoder in the world. It is known to have the best quality per byte that you create. Um, so, you know, if you have, you know, which we are splitting hairs a little bit, and I know this major studios would care, but you can get a very good, good result out of um, DCP-O-Matic, but that is using OpenJPEG and um, the you know, arguably the quality per byte is not as good, but you know you can always pump it up a, up a bit uh, and use more more data than you pro pro probably would want to use to get the same quality out of a more professional tool like the Kakadu encoder or the DVS encoder, where they've put a lot of effort in making sure that they get the best quality per byte put into the encode. So that's probably one of the biggest differences between using a, a free bit of software and. Uh, something that's paid for that's got some um, effort into the quality and the result that's going into it. But at the end of the day, I'm a big, be big believer that the person creating, doing the decisions and making the color decisions should also be the person who is baking that into the file that's going to go to the screen. So when you make a DCP out of Resolve, it may be a pre-show or just something you're showing to, to your, to, as a, as a pre-screener for yourself to make sure everything looks correct. But that file can then be taken to 
uh, a good DCP facility and then they will actually take that encry encrypted file and reuse it for the actual rollout of the, the, of the, the theatrical release. And so the same data, the same QC is all being done, it's all there, you don't have to do it again. And I think that's the way to go, it puts the responsibilities where they need to be and um, puts less work and less, prob less, less possibility that an error can occur between that, that process and the actual final theatrical release. Finally, we've got, I mentioned before, we've got um, Premiere. Premiere is very popular, it's got good work, um, tool chain, etc. The color space is a bit wanting compared to Resolve, and that's why usually you will see most independent films go through Resolve. Um, but um, they have a tool uh, in there for doing DCPs. It's very old. It is known to produce um, malformed DCPs, which will not play in some players. Um, I do not suggest you use it. I suggest you probably go actually towards D DCP O Matic. Um, I do expect um, Adobe most likely. Uh, next year or this year at the NAB will most likely reproduce the sort of features that um, Resolve is doing in terms of building those mastering tool chains with DCP and IMF directly into the software because if that's where you're making those decisions that's where you should cook it into the actual file formats. Um, it's just not right going have to go from this to this to this and there's lots of problems that occur in the middle. And finally uh, you still need those bigger facilities which have DCP mastering capabilities. There's a lot more than just exporting a DCP out of um, Resolve or some other software. Imp implementing um, the captioning and different soundtracks and all that sort of stuff aren't really terribly well done in these bits of software and they also don't really have the best QCing capabilities. And that's where you would probably go to a facility who is using more enterprise level stuff like um, Cine Asset or DVS Clipster that the studios have standardised on, who go through a more, um, you know, a much more detailed QC and testing capabilities before they run out and send out thousands of copies of a DCP. So these are your options, and I hope you understand the reasons why you would use them, who you are, and when you need to use them. All right. So uh, and also be aware that the SMPTE DCP, um, the capability of the metadata is quite new. It'll take a while for a lot of people to get their heads around it. Um, for example, the only software currently that can do the extended metadata is the Cine Asset software. Um, not really possible any of that yet, but that'll probably come. And again, you know, that's why you go to the, to the high-end tools when you're doing a proper um, theatrical release. It's probably better to go to, to a company that can offer those expertise and knowledge. Because really, at the end of the day, you can go and you can learn about how to use any of these tools, but using them and making and getting it right when that's the only chance you've got, that's why you go to a service provider who has done it before, knows what works, knows what's right, because you can't take that risk. All right, anyway, so there you go. Making a DCP in 2019, the year of the Cinti DCP. Um, thanks for listening. This is James Gardner, the Cinitech Geek. Bye for now.